Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation, which is now in virtual mode. One of the things that we were looking at very closely in the real world was the environmental and sustainability uh, issues around finance. And we have had for many months a sustainable finance for breakfast meeting. Well, it may not be breakfast time at which you're watching this, but the principle is still the same. The anchor of our sustainable finance meetings, as it has been for the last couple of years, is Ben Caldicott. Ben is the founding director of the uh, sustainable finance program at Oxford University's Smith School, but he's a man who has many other hats as well. He is amongst, and I was looking at his bio, so I'll just pick a, a few things out of an awful lot of hats to choose from. He's the chair of the International Green Finance Coordination Group. He is a strategy advisor for finance to COP26, which I think is really important. And I note that he is a judge of this year's Tech Nation new Net Zero Growth Programme. This, this month, we're delighted that we have a very eminent uh, backup, as it were. Elsa Palazza is, Palanza is the uh, M M Managing Director and Global Head of Sustainability and Citizenship at Barclays. Um, she joined Barclays a couple of years ago from the Gates, where she had been working with the Gates Foundation on the UN Sustainable Finance Goals, and before that, on the Clinton Global Initiative. So, you know, politically well, well plumbed in. Before that, however, I note and I quote that she spent several years in Washington, D.C., delivering geopolitical and industry risk analyses to large international energy companies. So, I think, a poacher turned gamekeeper. Uh, first of all, I'm going to give Elsa a few minutes to talk about what she's doing, how she is expiating for the guilt that she must feel for those years in Washington, expiating the guilt, what she's doing at Barclays, and then we'll move on to uh, Ben's agenda. Ben works through an agenda of what he's been up to over the last month and what he thinks you ought to worry about over the next month. Elsa will come in telling him where he's right, where he's wrong, and what he's missed. But I give you, Elsa Palanza, tell us what you're up to. Thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be here with you this morning. Well, it's been a really busy few months at Barclays, and so I might take this moment just to share uh, with this audience a few highlights um, of the work that we've been we've released into the public domain uh, at the beginning of April. Um, it's the culmination of quite a bit of, of fast-moving uh, effort, and but by no means the end. It's certainly just the beginning. Um, I, at the beginning of April, Barclays released a new position on climate change, and um, very importantly, uh, you know, was the work of of many months, as I mentioned. But I think that uh, what it indicates is really a desire for Barclays not only to take a leading position uh, when it comes to our assessment of climate change within our own portfolio, but also to be leaning into the community of practice that's been working at this for quite a very long time and thinking about better measurement mechanisms, better platforms. For assessing our own um, impact and perhaps exacerbation of the climate crisis, and how what is the correct and appropriate role for a bank really to be playing in all of this? In any case, um, it's worth noting that we have arrived at uh, an ambitious uh, set of goals. First and foremost, we've committed to align the entirety of our portfolio to the Paris goals and timelines. We're starting with our energy and power portfolios because those are indeed most material, uh, certainly for Barclays. But we're not going to stop there. Following that, we'll be taking on other carbon intensive sectors and industries and thinking about how we chart those pathways for alignment within our own portfolio. It was important to do that as a first step, but we also acknowledge that there's real work that needs to be done in the real economy. And in terms of aligning ourselves, not only to our domiciled home here in the UK, but really uh, leaning into the global goals that have been set around climate, it was also critical that we set an ambition to be net zero by 2050. And we're the first major bank of our kind to set an ambition of that kind. I will say that um, this is not a predefined course, as I think many of the listeners and watchers will know. This is a space that has um, a lot of unknowns and, and a lot of the same hiccups and challenges that we face in many other arenas, including appropriate data and the correct form, frameworks and parity across um, and between banks is constantly the, the challenge that we're going to be facing. But again, as I mentioned, I think the, the principle and goal here is really to uh, 
um, be part of a consortium of industry leaders and be thinking more about this. So perhaps I'll stop there, but I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, why, why don't you pick up on that, Ben? Tell us what you're up to, but also tell us what you think of uh, Barclays initiative in this area. And Caldicott. Sure. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, so as usual, we've had a lot go on over the last four to six weeks. I guess the last time we we did a recording was on the 6th of May. So I'll, I'll go through all those updates roughly in chronological order as quickly as I can and feel free to interject. But in, in specifically in relation to the Barclays announcement, obviously a, a quite a big deal, uh, given that they were under a lot of pressure for their track record in this area. One of the biggest lenders to the to fossil fuel projects and companies globally. Um, uh, I think ranked ranked the worst in Europe. I, I think it was the one of the rankings I saw a few months ago. And there's obviously the shareholder resolution. Um, but unquestionably committing to net zero uh, by mid-century is a is a big deal and will have big implications for their business. But like with any, like with all of this, of course, it's um it's all about detail. It's all about the interim targets and accountability for the implementation of those targets. So I'm sure They've got plans um, to do that properly. Um, so look forward to hearing more. But going on to, uh, to updates. So obviously, we're moving into sort of, you know, we've had this immediate crisis response phase with COVID, lots of money getting out the door to support companies. We're now moving into a phase where governments are thinking much more about um, bailouts for specific companies, for different industries, and the conditions that are associated with those bailouts. Um, one of the uh, bits of conditionality that was announced uh, last month was in Canada. So Canadian firms must file TCFD reports to get COVID-19 bailouts. Um, there have been other examples of conditionality introduced in different markets <coughs> over the last six weeks. Um, KLM Air France from the French government also had a, a bailout tied to reducing emissions from flight routes, and there have been, um, been other examples. So expect to see much more of that. But I thought that Canadian example was particularly interesting. Do you want to come in on that, Elsa, uh, the conditionality attached to bailouts around the world? Well, I think it is quite interesting, and it's really just a practical example of you know, what I think has been a, a, a concept that many have been leaning into recently, just thinking about how we might attach um, green and sustainable a green and sustainable agenda to um, the you know, regrowth and regeneration of the economy. And it's nice to see this in a really tangible example. I think that um, naturally there's a lot of conversation around, again, as I mentioned earlier, parity in terms of disclosure and reporting. And I think the example of, of choosing and, um, and reinforcing the TCFD framework is actually a positive move in this sense. I'm really looking forward. What, what will matter now is then what does that ha what happens in the market because of that? I think it's a really important um, point that it takes a little bit of um, of time for that to take hold. And fundamentally, what will, this will mean is that because all of those companies will be producing TCFD reports, there will be far more information and then better decision making hinged on that. And so it actually has a long tail of follow on effects and, and that will be interesting to watch. But I think it's a really positive move. Ben, where, where does the UK stand on this? Well, the UK has got something called Project Birch underway in um, Treasury and Bays and other departments to sort of figure out these these bailouts for different companies and industries. And I suspect as part of that, uh, there'll be conditionality. I'm kind of hoping hoping that in addition to TCFD um, reporting, which is which is all good and, and a positive step in the right direction, um, governments go a bit further. So, you know, there's been this innovation in sustainability linked loans and sustainability linked bonds recently in the markets over the last two years real explosion in interest there where your cost of capital is tied to you meeting or exceeding different sustainability kpis um you know i think governments could introduce similarly um tied loans and you know if you if you exceed certain esg scores or whatever the kpi is then um, you'll get a lower cost of capital um, so they're different, um, but there are many different structures, of course. And then uh, there's a broader point, which I think we talked about last time, which is clearly governments are going to own bigger stakes of the economy. Um, and even if it is, you know, there are lots of loans, uh, a lot of these are going to be structured as debt that converts to equity when they can't be repaid. Mm -hmm. And so how does government manage that ownership stake in the economy over potentially, you know, a decade or more? Um, because as we've seen with, for example, RBS, you know, these stakes can um, last for quite some time. But at the moment, we don't have clear rules, clear conditionality attached to the Project Birch initiative. Not that I have seen. Um, I mean, there might might be stuff privately. I, I'm not. I'm not aware. 
But I, I imagine it sounds like there's going to be a bunch of, you know, <laughs> given where we are in the cycle, I think they're probably going to be quite a few Project, Project Birch type announcements coming yeah. coming our way in the next month or so. Project Birch guess. is the last chance saloon for, for big companies in the UK and have rather terrifying prospect uh continue anyway what's on your what's on? yeah so so look i mean we always talk about we always have a section on on esg data so let, let me go there uh, one of the things that happened in may was that msci launched um two open source tools for for people to look at look at their esg data um and, and these are the these are the data points that drive their indices and their other products um and i think they sort of did this preemptively because of changing eu regulations but the fact that it was done preemptively it means you can go onto the msci website search for these esg ratings that before you you'd have to get a subscription for um is quite interesting um so that was one one development uh, a, a, another thing in relation to scores and ratings um, from the SEC in the US. We had their chairman um, highlighting issues around um, the, the problem of aggregation and aggregate confusion that results from bringing together all of these different things. So a lot of the ESG scores for, for ES and G will have, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 plus indicators for each of each of those three components. And in different ways, they're often often measuring the same thing in slightly different ways, um, and that can that can mean that the numbers just end up being they're very hard to interpret or basically meaningless in some in some cases. So that, that that's been raised by the SEC, which is kind of interesting. Well, let let, let me ask Elsa to come in on the ratings issue. I mean, there are obviously users of ratings. Um, what kind of what kind of developments are you looking for in the sector, and what, are you comfortable with the way that it's going at the present time? Well, I think we see some of the same issues we're facing, you know, across the board. We are thinking about our own disclosures and uh, the fact that each one of these requires a very bespoke and manual approach to making sure that you're answering the questions in exactly the right way. It's a little bit like taking, um, at least in the U.S., we had certain standardized exams. And if you knew how to sort of gain the, the exam, it was more about that than it was about the actual information. And I think that we need to make sure we're not setting up a system where it's Pleasing the, pleasing the algorithm or pleasing the system rather than actually thinking about the quality and substance of the, of the data itself. Um, I, I mean, I think to a certain extent, it's good that there's been sort of a race to the top for um, more and better frameworks. I don't think we've arrived at a perfect system yet, but at a certain point, if we have a proliferation of, um, as, as Ben said, ways and types of, of cutting this data, none of which actually... Uh, compared to one another on an equal basis, it's deeply um, complicated and, and frustrating both for the producers of the data and the consumers. And then you layer on top of that the fact that it's not just the agencies themselves. We've certainly seen an, a good number of investors who have then their own set of algorithms on top of that. So they might combine data from a couple of, of producers um, and, and layer on their own look, which of course is their prerogative and that's completely fine. But I think fundamentally we're going to get to a, a real mess if we, if we can't find a way, and I really don't have a good solution here. I don't know how we go about doing this, but if we can find a way to actually have that harmonization across the industry, it would be hugely helpful. Yeah, I mean, there's always this danger that if you shine too bright a light on something, you really can't see it because you're dazzled by the light that uh, excludes the things that you're actually trying to look at. Are we in danger of that at all with, uh, with ratings and scores, Ben? Well, I think we've got, to, we've got to spend more attention trying to identify the actual signals that affect performance. And uh, of course, that's the job of asset managers and active managers in particular. Um, and instead of them, you know, a, a lot, a lot of fund managers are basically just taking these off the shelf ESG scores and that's driving whether they're underweight, overweight, certain holdings. Um, and you know, that's one, a bit lazy and two, we could, we, we understand that, that these things aren't very good at picking up the signals. Having said that, um, you know, there's just been a bit of research published by Morningstar, uh, a couple of days ago saying that. Six out of ten sustainable funds delivered higher returns than equivalent conventional funds over the last decade. So they're looking at performance yep. over one, three, five, ten years. Financial Times ESG funds beat market over ten years. Exactly, exactly. Um, and then, and then there's been quite recent, you know, more recent studies 
you know, just looking over the last few months and going, look, they've, they've been more resilient. There's been less volatility than conventional funds. Um, but, you know, the counter argument to that is, well, uh, you know, these guys have been underweight. They've basically excluded the energy sector, uh, which has been the most volatile sector. Uh, and, you know, what happens when, when all prices go back up? Um, and and then you, you know then, then the sustainability funds might not be performing as well as the, the conventional counterparts. So, you know, people people are going to argue about this all, all the time um, for a very long time to come. But I think you know we we need to work to improve the underlying data and make sure that we're measuring things that actually make a difference. Which leads me to my next point, which is other bit of news. Uh, sometimes on these calls, I talk about spatial finance and the role of geospatial data and analysis and really understanding what's going on in companies, whether they're listed or non-listed. Um, Planet Labs, um, which is one of the sort of the new generation of cool companies from San Francisco launching constellations of satellites has just been piggybacking on um, these various SpaceX launches recently to put loads more satellites in orbit to improve the resolution, the refresh rates of imagery that can be used for a bunch of different use cases, but potentially um, these finance use cases. And that's very exciting. And I think tomorrow, if all goes well, um, a, a, a satellite from GHG Sat, a company based in Canada, uh, that can that can monitor greenhouse gas emissions, point source emissions, I think mainly methane at the moment anyway, methane emissions from space. So it can identify where methane leaks are from space. Um, and so you're getting these sort of these platforms, these constellations going up that have different, that have a variety of different use cases, not just finance ones, but will over time create data that we can use to get, get, get ESG insights into companies. I think it's absolutely fascinating. Along those, it's, it's, it's tangential, but uh, along the same lines, the Harvard study, which actually looked at traffic patterns in Wuhan to discover that uh, there were the parking lot in the Wuhan hospital started filling up as early as September uh, rather than in December. So perhaps the coronavirus started in China a couple of months earlier. That is the kind of uh, thing that comes out of uh, I guess, geospatial technology that one doesn't really expect. But um, let me ask Elsa, how do you feel about these developments? I think it's it's hugely exciting. I mean, I, I, you know, just building off the concept of um, disclosure, it's obviously incredibly critical that that every company is able to take and and has the responsibility to take res- to disclose their own information, and the process of amalgamating that internally is also really important because then that's a, that's a good strategic lens through which they can make decisions. But to have it validated, um, sort of unequivocally by third party, and indeed by quite literally eyes in the sky, is adds a whole other element. And I think hopefully, you know, we'll we'll be able to just um, clarify and streamline a lot of this. And also show us things that we don't know. You know, not all of this is terribly malicious. Sometimes um, there are things that are happening in industries or globally that that you know humans would do better if they if they knew how to or could or were you know made aware of the fact that something was happening. So it, it's it's a it's an added benefit of being able to to call out spaces where we can do better. You know, whether or not we are aware of them. Let me let me ask you, Ben. I mean, you you. You said that the satellite that's going up tomorrow can check methane emissions. I mean, methane is a is a real and growing problem, is it not? I mean, is it something that is really concerning you? I mean, methane is a, a heat generator, something like thirty times that of carbon dioxide, is it not? Yep, it's uh, definitely one of the worst greenhouse gases. A, a real problem, um, particularly methane leaks from oil and gas production, um, but also agriculture. Uh, and so, you know, that, that eye in the sky capability will allow them to identify, as I understand it, identify leaks in oil and gas pipelines and other infrastructure all, all over the place. And the next sort of ge- generation of capability is, you know, how can you use some of those satellites to help you identify point sources from uh, carbon dioxide, which is a much smaller molecule and harder to detect? Um, and with combina- in combination with other sensors and other bits of data, you could then have a much better understanding, or, or at least at the very least an assurance mechanism to, to, to make sure that if companies say they're disclosing X from their power stations or from their factories, that you can actually check that they're telling the truth. Or you could even tell if governments are telling the truth, right? I mean, in, in the UN process, governments are saying, well, our emissions were this, 
uh, well, were, were they? So these capabilities introduce that, 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 that ability to assure the data. Fascinating. Continue down your agenda. Sure. So another thing that keeps popping up, uh, regular supervisory development. So the Central Banks and Supervisors Network for Greening the Financial System, the NGFS, is on a bit of a roll at the moment. They've got now 66 members. Um, it's only two years old. Uh, pretty much all the big super, super supervisors and central banks, apart from the Fed, although I think there's sort of pressure for the Fed to join. And they just published a couple of things late last month. The first is a guide for central banks and supervisors um, around the management of climate risks and environmental risks. And this, this essentially sets out, you know, you've got supervisors and central banks should figure out what the transmission mechanisms are. They should figure out which entities are exposed. They should allocate resources within their own institutions to develop capabilities in this area. They should set supervisory expectations for regulated firms essentially doing many of the things that the Bank of England has sort of pioneered over the last five years. Uh, so that's an interesting development that sort of you, building you say, consensus. You say that the Fed is not, is not a member, but are any of the other US supervisors or regulators involved in it? So from memory, I, th I think some of the state regulators might be, maybe some of, because insurance is regulated at a state level in the United mm -hmm. States, for example. Um, but I don't think any of the federal regulators are yet. The OCC or the FDIC? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's I mean, I do you have a view on that, that, Elsa? Well, I and this is, this is um, more rumor than any sort of uh, domain knowledge, I will admit, but I do know that I think there's been some interesting conversations going on. The, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the Fed makes a move. I think, um, unfortunately, given the political environment in the United States, Right now, there's just so little appetite, and there's so many distractions um, that I think it's tough uh, given the given moment. But I, I think I wouldn't be surprised if that move does happen. You know, in the next year or so, that would be great, and it would obviously be a tremendous move on behalf of the global markets. I mean, if the Fed moves, that's going to unlock a whole lot of other things just because of the sheer scale and size of of the market and the and the domain. So, um, I think it would be a really good move. I, you know, again. Rumor is that they're sniffing around, but I don't know any better than anyone else. So, but of course, I mean, the the Fed's role in this is limited. In some sense, it would be better to get the OCC on board, which actually does the supervision sort of at street level. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I think I think that's where it does matter that the the Fed actually has um, a place in American society and in sort of the political domain, even if it's not per se a political entity uh, that is really important. It's a, sort of the, the indicators and and um, perspective that it takes in the market is is hugely influential. So I think that might be why it's critical for the for the Fed in particular, just given its role in in the U.S. in particular. Okay, Ben. Yeah, so we've had growing calls from uh, st stakeholders across society, company executives, civil society, politicians calling from, for, a, for, for a greener and more resilient recovery, building back better, all these things. Um, we've also had an intervention from central bank governors as well, making exactly the same point. So a joint, jo jointly authored uh, op-ed in The Guardian from the Governor of the Bank of England, the Governor of the Bank of France, um, Mark Carney. Uh, and Frank Elderson, who chairs the NGFS that I was mentioning before, uh, making that call for, look, if we're going to do stimulus, we should do it uh, in a way that's a win-win with sustainability and the environment. So there seems to be huge amounts of consensus that that's the way to go. What is Mark Carney up to these days? I think you asked me that last time. Um, <laughs> I was really as I driving this debate forward. Yeah, no, he, he, well, he is indeed. Uh, he's got two roles that I'm aware of. Um, the first is he is the UN Secretary General Special Envoy for Climate Change, or one of them. Uh, he, the UN Secretary General might have more than one. Um, he replaced Mike Bloomberg in that role. And then the second role is he is the Prime Minister's Advisor on Climate Finance for COP26. And where do, can I just ask you where COP26 now stands at you know, month to month? Yeah, so I think the thing that ha that's happened since we last spoke, Andrew, is that the date has been moved. That's been confirmed. So it's now um, in November 2021, from the 1st to the 12th of November, and still in Glasgow. 
and we all knew that it was going to be postponed. We didn't know for how long. That's probably the longer end, or that is at the longer end of the, the postponements. Uh, and I think that's a very good thing because it creates a nice runway, a longer runway to to build momentum, to can make certain things happen. Uh, and of course, the big elephant in the room with COP was always the US elections. So um, it was originally going to be straight after the US presidential elections, and um, and you it had the you know if there was a change of administration, you you would have a a president elect who was straight out of an election campaign and might, one might have found it hard to engage. And if Trump was still in office, then obviously that would that might be a problem for the, for the process. Um, but that at least there'll be clarity hmm. by that stage. We hope. Do you have a, Do you have a view on COP twenty six, Elsa? Well, I I was I admit I was disappointed that it was pushed out so far. But I think Ben is right that it's probably ultimately better that we have um, a long runway, as you said, to, to make some progress. And particularly now, in, in the, given all the recovery that needs to happen, and which will be obviously a many, many years process following COVID, um, again, there's this linkage between sort of green and sustainable injection into economic recovery, and how do you tie that to long-term and big picture global goals? You know, this is a systems level conversation. Um, which we're not always terribly good at having. And so I think hopefully this will allow us to do the the fine-tuned work of making sure that the priorities for the COP are um, are indeed able to to make progress. And I apologize. I think the connection on my no. laptop is not great. I hope it's working okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Back to you, Ben. So um, investor engagement, shareholder activism, uh, again, another theme that comes up again and again. There was a bit of analysis from uh, a research group called Proxy Insight, um, covered by FTFM, looking at climate resolutions at AGMs. And apparently climate resolutions, of which there have been quite a few, um, have received on average 23% support from shareholders, um, compared with 16% for the whole of 2019. Uh, obviously, Barclays has felt that, <laughs> that pressure. Uh, you've also had... Um, asset owners starting to come together to unite on climate lobbying. So basically, you know, you've got a lot of firms that, that are spending money on lobby groups and a lot of those lobby groups are going to be uh, are trying to undermine, actively undermine progress on climate change. And investors are quite, are quite annoyed about that for understandable reasons. And so they want to pinpoint which companies are giving money to which lobby groups and which lobby groups are being a problem. And, and then they want to put pressure on their investee companies. So there was a, an initiative that was just announced with AP7, which is one of the Swedish um, pension funds, BNP Paribas Asset Management, and also the Church of England Pensions Board to develop a framework to do that in a consistent and effective way. And that was announced uh, a week or two ago. Okay, two things there, uh, shareholder pressure and also these, um, I suppose, fight back lobby groups. Shareholder pressure first, Elsa. Yeah, so I think, um, yes, I mean, there's obviously no surprise that Barclays felt this acutely this year. And I will say a couple of things about that. I, I think in our case, it was actually, um, it was really helpful fuel to the fire, no pun intended, in terms of, uh, you know, when you have a deadline around your own AGM, it helps to focus and to, um, to accelerate work. Um, that in our case was already underway, which is good. And I think that's the critical issue here is that it could have been really, really difficult. It was still a challenge, but it could have been extraordinarily difficult if they, we had not been having conversations internally about opportunities for leadership around the climate agenda. Um, I, I think there's a couple of things that we should be thinking about. While I certainly embrace the, the opportunity for um, investor engagement, and that's the right way for, um, obviously, for investors to be, to be leaning into their holdings, I think that the engagement part is the critical part here. Um, showing up at the door of a company where the fully drafted resolution and then engaging in some sort of tete-a-tete -tete negotiation is probably not the best way to make change all the time that I think uh, we've seen some really successful examples in the United States of some um, shareholder uh, activity that has actually, they've gone to the, the boards and to the executive management of companies and with conceptual frameworks and said, this is the kind of thing we're looking for. How might we build a resolution together? And, and if you obviously don't get on board, then we will file it without you. But I think the idea here is how do you actually embed that into 
the leadership and the strategic decision making of executive management and allow it for to for it to grow um, grow in the right kind of way internally inside a company. This is where you think about good governance as well and ensuring that these systems are built and and take on board you know new and, and important progressive steps, but in a way that it's actually going to be led from within by the company rather than sort of forced from the outside. I think we have to be careful that we don't ent enter into a domain where it's sort of um, governance by external proxy. Uh, that being said, I just want to make sure I'm clear on the fact that I think that um, it's a really helpful tool. I, I understand why it's being deployed more. It's just about how it's deployed and ways that, that it will be most productive, frankly, now having seen it from the inside. Let, let, let me ask Ben if you want to respond on that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, asset owners trying to influence investee companies in a way that, that encourages more sustainable outcomes, you know, we're only at the very beginning of how to do that properly, right? And I, and I don't think that it's, it's, uh, it can be so much more effective and exciting and important, actually, as a lever of change than it currently is. And I don't believe... Uh, and I think Elsa and I would agree on this that you know shareholder resolutions are, are, the, are necessarily the, the the right lever um, all the time. Um, and in, and I also think there's a broader set of conversations with other providers of finance and capital, right? So it's not just about a listed equity conversation. Um, I think you know the role of banks like Barclays is really important. It's one reason why I'm a big fan of sustainability linked loans. Mm -hmm. Nothing like a kind of cost of capital incentive to really change behavior. Um, so I think we need, yeah, we need a much more expansive conversation about how financial institutions can engage with companies to improve outcomes. But you don't, you don't necessarily share the view that it is counterproductive to put up a firm, uh, carefully worked out, um, finely worded proposal that um, it seems that what Elsa is saying is, is let's, Let's schmooze this rather than than confront. Well, well, clearly the confrontation worked in you know seemed to have worked in this case, right, Elsa? Um, so, well, I think I actually disagree a little bit there. I think that the the conversations we had and the 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 raising of the concept helped in terms of moving us forward at a faster pace than we might have otherwise done. I think in a, the ideal scenario would have been here that we actually arrived at a commonly agreed resolution. Uh, for those who were following this, we actually ended up having two resolutions at our AGM, one that was uh, drafted by Barclays and the other that was drafted by the, um, the shareholder group that had brought the original resolution to us. We really actually would have preferred to have one. We would have preferred to work together to actually arrive at a set of language that is practical and appropriate for, for a bank. Um, just because I think that sends a better signal, it's a stronger signal uh, and, is, and is indicative of the you know, the progress that does need to be made. And I think there's always compromise. It's important to not to be nudged in the right direction. And so please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we don't want to be pushed because that's, that's entirely appropriate, especially by, by shareholders. But I think that um, in an ideal scenario, there would have been some really robust dialogue and opportunity for, um, for sort of deep analysis and discussion about the, the meat of the issue itself and not the what, because we agreed from the beginning on the premise. The whole idea about aligning to Paris was something that, you know, spiritually and, and um, philosophically, I think everyone completely agreed on. It was actually about the how and the sort of levers that were being pulled internally and the difference between being asked to basically divest or phase out support for clients full stop from the beginning versus the concept of transition and the imperative. Um, and the opportunity for banks to be stewards of the transition to a low carbon economy. And that, that was really kind of the main sticking point. And we were really firm in our thought that it, that's, that's a really important space to, to be leaning into right now. And particularly when you think about the appropriate role of banks, what can we do? What's our highest and best use um, as an institution to make progress here? And I think one of them might be to actually and we, we haven't fully cracked how to do this yet, let me say that. But I think if we can be, like I said, stewards of the transition, then um, we should be doing that rather than walking away because there's plenty of capital still floating around out in the world. Uh, and, you know, I think unfortunately right now, if, if someone who's deemed nefarious is, you know, in terms of the, the carbon intensity of their, their products is going to be looking for more capital, they might just walk away and go to another place. Whereas if there's a real opportunity for engagement, 
I think that we can make change. Now that that whole paradigm might change over time, but I do think that you know thought leaders like Mark Carney have leaned into the into the transition heavily as well, and so that was sort of the main premise behind what we felt like was probably most productive here. Back to you, Ben. Yeah, I mean, I uh, obviously I wasn't party to any of those conversations. I, I, I just think that you know, I think the argument from Barclays would be stronger had had you you know, if you had a track record of being a real leader in this area, um, and there are lots of other banks who are doing arguably and have done arguably much more. Um, so it did feel like it had got to the stage where, and obviously, you know, the, the NGOs also they go through the list of all the different targets, and they and they pick. Pick, pick a kind of high profile laggard, right? And that was Barclays. Um, so it's sort of like it, it has, it has well, to be it definitely, definitely, yeah, exactly. Oh, and you, you can, you know, I think the other point here, of course, is that the difference between the leaders and the laggards is not so great. You know, there are opportunities to leapfrog. Okay. Yep. So, but, you know, had you articulated your desire to do that, then you probably wouldn't have been targeted in the way that you were. So I do, th- I sort of think yep. they, they got you to crystallize. Mm-hmm. Some thoughts, and, and and you're now on the hook for the for, okay. for policy. Okay, next on your agenda. Okay, um, so uh, asset owners now. Um, a couple of developments, you know, just not not particularly exciting developments, but you know, the the the, the world's largest sovereign wealth fund, Norges Bank, the Norwegian Global Pension Fund, has divested from a bunch of um, mining companies and power utilities. A lot of these guys had breached different guidelines that Norges Bank have on on coal. Um, so they ditched stock in Glencore Anglo-American RWE. We also had an announcement from USS, my, my pension scheme, the University Superannuation Scheme, which is the largest UK pension fund, that it was going to uh, divest from, from coal and, and other things, tobacco, uh, various other things, which sort of came as a you know, I was welcomed, but seemed to be a, probably a little a little too late from USS. Um, but progress of sorts, from some, at least that's what some people thought. Can I ask a, a question here? I mean, there are more contentious mining issues. What about cobalt, which is absolutely crucial to battery technology, and yet largely comes from China and from the DRC, and obviously is mined in extremely dodgy conditions? What is... What is the general feeling within the environmental community, as it were, about things that are crucial to an electric future, but at the same time in the short term may be very damaging to the environment? Well, I, I think any sensible view is that you, you, you've got to also put pressure on um, those suppliers to make sure they meet high environmental standards. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I haven't detected... Well, I mean, is there inconsistency in in people's position on this? I haven't detected that really. Um, although, you know, and people, there is a lot of research looking at the embedded emissions, the embedded impact of electric vehicles as well, um, to make sure that we're actually, you know, that it actually does make a difference. There was some analysis that came out I saw yesterday, looking at the sort of the lifetime emissions embedded in a in a Tesla Model Three. Um, in comparison to an internal combustion engine equivalent, and you know, it, even even with U.S. grid electricity, a good chunk of which comes from coal and gas, um, it's massively, massively, massive improvement over an internal combustion engine equivalent. Continue then, Ben. Uh, another asset owner. This is this is Stanford um, committing to net zero. I flag this because there have been three big institutions, three big universities that have made net zero commitments in the last six weeks, uh, starting with Oxford, and then Harvard, and then Stanford. Uh, so there seems to be some momentum there, which is kind of interesting because for you know these university endowments have been the target of divestment campaigns for you know since the divestment movement began really in in 2013, 2012, 11, 13, something like that. Uh, and suddenly they've all kind of gone at roughly the same time. Do you have a view on that, Elsa? No, I just have been watching with interest the, the trend. I mean, I, I, um, when I was back when I was in university a million years ago, there were already some initial conversations around this very nascent ones. And I think that it's, 
uh, those large institutions have endowment funds that are so extraordinarily large that actually it ends up making a difference. And, and uh, so I'm, I'm not at all surprised, though. I mean, I think it's a, the right population and the right community of, of thinkers who would be nudging their, um, their endowment owners you know, in the right direction. So it's, it's is, there, is there any sort of standardization on the, on the uh, criteria for divestment or is it completely idiosyncratic to the institution involved? There, there are some, yes, there are some idiosyncrasies. Uh, I mean, I think the key thing with the Oxford announcement was was really the focus on engagement. So going back to our previous conversation, so it was, it wasn't, it was kind of divestment plus engagement. So the endowment would have to engage with all companies and all sectors um, around net zero. Now, you know, how do you pick targets to engage with? How do you track progress? What are your KPIs if you're a small, a relatively small investor? Those are all things that need to be worked out. But there was much more emphasis on engagement as a theory of change than divestment as a theory of change. Continue. Okay, so we had um, Lord Barker on last time, and um, he was talking about aluminium. The London Metal Exchange announced plans for a a parallel market for low carbon aluminium. So um, I guess aluminium supplies will be labeled and then be traded on this parallel market uh, for greener metal, which I think is a, a very interesting, important development. A lot of that's, come, a lot of that's resulted from um, pressure actually from, from, um, from Lord Barker. And, uh, and that's a so testament to his lobbying for that to come is through. It is it possible in the, in the secondary market because aluminium is fungible? I mean, I, I realize that electricity is a huge component of tr the transfer from alumina to aluminum, but, uh, but the, the, ma the metal becomes fungible very quickly, doesn't it? Is, isn't it? My, my understanding is there must be some way to trace it, and I don't know how, how they do that, but that, that would seem to be a condition for, for having that parallel do you, market. Do you think it's extensible, extendable to other metals? or? Trade? Well, in principle, it, it, it could be. Um, I mean, and obviously it'll be interesting to see how that that, low, that lower carbon aluminium trades, uh, whether it trades at a premium, as you'd expect it would. Uh, but you have similar issues, of course, with other metals. Yeah, I mean, if you're using using um, um, metal that's been recycled, then that will have a lower lower carbon content than than fresh or virgin metal, and you know that that, that has an environmental benefit. So if we can trace it, then we can price them differently. And there seems to be consumer demand, you know, lots of consumer demand in that direction. I think one of the key things, an impetus for this was really big um, consumers of aluminium, um, electric car makers, uh, Apple, you know, some of those, those big companies going, look, we really want to be able to differentiate. I mean, this is not virtue signaling. This is really something genuine that the LME sees as a new market. Yeah, well, exactly. Elsa, do you have a view on this? I don't know a terrible um, amount about this, so I would just say that I, th I find it very interesting. I think the tracking part is obviously critical, um, and it gets into this interesting conversation around demand-led initiatives and demand-led um, opportunities. And I think exactly as has been said, if consumers are looking for this, there'll be that much more incentive. And you know, then you look at price premiums too, and an opportunity for for uh, you know an appetite for that is kind of interesting. So, back to your agenda. Yeah, so something else that was announced at the beginning of the month, uh, emissions trading. So earlier this month, the UK government published a, a consultation response uh, on the, the UK emissions trading scheme. So because the UK has left the EU, we're leaving the EU ETS. Um, we had a UK ETS before joining the EU ETS, um, but this new ETS um, will be net zero aligned. It'll be the first ever net zero aligned emissions trading scheme. That has implications for the design of the scheme, the role of offsets, um, potentially a negative target uh, by definition because it's net zero. Uh, and I think that could be very important for a variety of different sectors who need a way, an economic signal to justify investment. So, for example, if you're thinking about investing in carbon capture and storage in the UK, well, how, do you, how, how are you going to pay for that? Um, and who's going to pay for it? And one way of creating that economic signal is by being able to generate offsets from storing carbon um, and, and getting a credit that you can then sell into an emissions trading scheme. So 
that that should be watched fairly closely, not just for actors in the UK, um, because because obviously that that will cover a variety of different sectors, but also people who are interested in emissions trading internationally, because the UK has um, and has historically kind of been quite innovative on ETS design. There are lots of opportunities to learn from the failures of the EU ETS. The EU ETS has not been a great success. Um, and that could be a template for reforms to the EU ETS, but also for other um, other jurisdictions as well. So quite an interesting development if you're into carbon markets. Elsa? Well, I actually was going to ask Ben a question about that. I'm curious if you think this is going to, to, um, to be a, a an item of conversation as we lead towards COP, just thinking to your point about this being an international conversation, I recognize that this is not sort of of the global national level that typically we're looking at at COP, but in terms of the tangential conversations that are often going on there, is this an item that would raise to that level or do you not anticipate it going there? So one of the the, the key things about COP uh, is, is something called Article 6, um, which is all of kind of about carbon markets, but... Right. Um, but they're different kinds of carbon markets. So um, you have that Article 6 conversation, which is sort of about how developed and developing countries account for emissions and make sure they're not double counting and things like that. You then have these sectoral or jurisdictional emissions trading schemes. So I mentioned the UK ETS, that's a jurisdictional one. A sectoral one could be something like Corsia, which is the sort of new carbon market for international aviation that's Mm -hmm. been set up by ICAO. Uh, and the other ones that are being talked about for other sectors of the global economy. And then you have voluntary carbon markets, mm-hmm. which are, you know, companies go, okay, well, we want to buy some offsets. Um, right. And we've got to make sure that those voluntary markets, all of those markets actually have really robust standards and that offsets are, you know, yeah. are actually making a difference and they're not kind of treated as indulgences um, that don't, don't really do anything. Mm-hmm. So, those are all. Those are definitely all conversations that will come up at COP. Some of those conversations are quite uh, delicate. Yes. Uh, particularly the Article Six ones, because of the kind of developing, developed country distinction and some of those sensitivities. Do you want to come back on that, Elsa? No, I just, I, I just find that interesting. I mean, I, I am aware of the conversation around Article Six, and I suppose that you know this added time we have until the the COP is hopefully a space where that can be worked out or made progress. Um, n- no, I, I probably don't have anything else to add at, at this point. Okay, just... then let's uh, look forward. What have we got to look forward to over the next month or so? First of all, Ben. I'm very much living in the now, Andrew. I'm kind <laughs> of, um, I'm really having trouble thinking about what's coming up other than just more Zoom calls. Uh, <laughs> No, I should. No, uh, I'm so sorry. Yes, there is one thing. Um, <laughs> London Climate Action Week. I knew there was at least one thing, um, which is, I think, the 1st to the 3rd of July. And um, last, I think the first one happened last year. It was for over a course of a week. It's a sort of mini one because of COVID all online. Um, but there's something like 60 events planned. Um, we're organizing one. I'm involved in organizing one with Stiglitz and Stern and um, colleagues at Oxford to talk about a green and resilient recovery, but there are going to be lots of other great events. So um, there's a website, I think, if you Google London Climate Action Week, then you'll be able to find a list of all those events, and you can you can gorge yourself on all the wonderful convening that's going on. Something else that's coming up imminently on the 22nd, 23rd of June, maybe on to the 24th, is uh, the, the, fu- the sort of future of the company purpose of the company um, thing organized by the British Academy and Professor Colin Mayer, a colleague at Oxford, um, which is, again, a series of webinars, including some great speakers, Mark Carney being one of them, but others too, examining, you know, what, what, what should companies be doing? What is their societal purpose? How is that changing? How can they realize that in different ways? Really fascinating series of questions based on, um, I think, a, a multi-year research project with leading scholars in the British Academy. So I would um, look that up. This is the kind of gentler capitalism talk that uh, the Financial Times is also involved in. Uh, can I give you the final word, Elsa, what, uh, Elsa Palanza? What uh, are you up to over the next month? 
Well, the next month is going to be critical for us. Um, you know, as we mentioned at the beginning, it is all well and good for us to have put out some ambitious targets or some ambitious goals, I should say. But now comes the really important and difficult work of making sure that we set uh, near medium long term targets and timelines for how exactly we will show progress on those goals. So that is the work that is deeply um, you know, underway at the moment and is going to take a, a whole lot of systemic change inside the bank. And that's quite exciting. And it also means that, you know, you're moving levers of a 328 year old institution. Um, and it's that kind of systems change that's deeply gratifying if you can do it at that kind of scale. Um, but it, it's requiring a sort of whole of a whole of company approach at the moment. So well, under those uh, circumstances, good luck. What can I say? Good luck to you. <laughs> thank you to you, Elsa. Thank you, as always, to you, Ben. And thank you to all of you who've been watching. See you again next month. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much.